Oh hi, I didn't see you there. My name is Bliss Foster and today we are going to back up and take a wider view at Dean Nivasalia's first haute couture show at Balenciaga. We're gonna approach this in a really different way, but I think it's gonna be really good. So if you have the time, hang with me. I would love to hear what your thoughts are after you get to the conclusion. I remember when Vetma first came on the scene, I remember actually saying out loud, this is the most exciting thing in fashion I've seen in years, especially that brilliant styling from Lada Volcava. But by the time that Dimna went on to accept his position as the creative director at Balenciaga, the public narrative began to take shape around his work. For the first time, people started saying that it was a joke. I mean, like how many times have you heard someone assert that Dimna is over at the headquarters of Balenciaga saying, ha ha, watch this, they'll buy anything. Have you heard that before? Here's the deal, I think that that is true, but I think it's an oversimplification. Let's talk. Dimna's work is undeniably ironic. If I was forced to boil down his work into a single word, it would be irony. It's self-referential, there are literal jokes, and the whole thing has a strong feeling that the body who guides the hand of these collections is always rolling its eyes. But it's very easy to stop there, just to get caught up in your emotions, feel like you're being played, get offended, and to simply say, well, this is mostly t-shirts and hoodies anyway, I hate it. But there is something more here, and if we ignore that, I feel like we're missing out on a big opportunity to learn about the culture that we all live in. Let's spend a little bit of time talking about why irony exists at all. There's a really good essay by David Foster Wallace called E Unibus Plurum, where he mostly is talking about television, but he spends a good bit of that article talking about the history of irony in culture. For centuries, irony was a tool that was used by artists to tell the truth about society when they had no other means of changing it. The essay, A Modest Proposal, is a great example of that. That's a 1729 essay by Jonathan Swift that proposes that we take orphan children and use their skin to make leather goods. He is obviously not being being serious and is using that pretty horrid suggestion to bring light to the fact that orphans were treated horribly in 18th century England. There were already countless people at the time advocating for the better treatment of orphan children, but none of those people were getting any traction. So Swift was trying to wake up those lawmakers by suggesting something that was absolutely horrendous sounding in an attempt to say, is it really so different from the way that we're treating them now? So this is to say that historically, irony was being used so that people could speak truth to power. It was a rarely used tool that allowed advocates and the oppressed to speak more freely. David Foster Wallace has a great quote about this where he says, the great thing about irony is that it splits things apart, gets above them so that we can see the flaws and hypocrisies and duplicates. Then World War I happened and irony changed. One of the single lowest points in all of humanity when America chose to use a weapon that could kill millions of people instantly. The use of the atomic bomb created an anxiety in humanity that had never been felt before. The decades following World War II were actually when psychological counseling first started to catch on. Because for the first time in human history, it was possible for, in an instant, for you and everyone that you love to instantly die and never even know that you were in danger. There was this mass anxiety about the bomb. And so culture and specifically entertainment started to respond to this new anxiety. Hey Bliss, what does this have to do with Balenciaga? Hang with me chief, we're getting there. Over the course of the decades following World War II, evening talk shows started to become less about the subjects that they were interviewing or talking about and became more and more about the process of making a talk show. They became self-referential. They were running inside jokes. Maybe more directly, absurdist humor started catching on in a major way in the decades following World War II. David Foster Wallace asserts that all of this is a reaction to this new internalized anxiety that at any moment everyone could just die. Self-referential jokes, constantly rolling your eyes at everything, just irony in general was the brain's way of coping with the fear of the atomic bomb. After two full generations of people coping with this anxiety through irony, we got my generation, the millennials, and now we've moved even further into Gen Z. There's less of an ironic response to instant annihilation, but the irony has stuck around. And I would say the irony has increased substantially since the internet came about. Ironic entertainment has maybe been the single most influential type of media that I have ever taken in. If you look at the entirety of the culture of memes and TikTok and Twitter and Instagram, everything is so heavily imbued with irony that it almost doesn't make sense to talk about it. 
Irony is so foundational to the conversation that irony has just kind of become the conversation. I've recently been grappling a lot with my own relationship with irony because on the one hand, irony is exhausting. Rolling your eyes constantly at everything and never fully saying exactly what you mean, that, that process is very taxing, at least for me personally. I spend so much time making fun of things and rolling my eyes at stuff that when it comes time to actually say what I mean about something, I struggle to articulate that. And David Foster Wallace has this quote where he says that irony is the song of the prisoner who has come to love his cage. But is that it? Dean is just the product of a huge problem with young people. Too ironic, no convictions. Is that the whole story? I don't think it is. On the other hand, we are three generations, almost four, into the era of irony. Speaking for myself, that's kind of all I know. I make fun of things that I love. It's not something I love about myself, but it's there and I don't think it's going away. Dimna presented his first couture collection at Balenciaga recently, and it was ironic as f The one place that the old guard of fashion considered to be the final home of fashion was invaded by t-shirts and hoodies. And there's this false dichotomy that we talk about a lot. Are you going to be sincere or are you making fun of this? And for myself, if I'm being really honest, there's a lot of times when I'm doing both. I am saying what I mean, but the only way I know how to express that is by being kind of goofy, by being truly sincere and at the same time, making fun of my own sincerity. I think we've all just been around so much irony that it really, truly, honestly is just part of our DNA. And there was a sincerity in this Balenciaga show. It was held at the place that Cristobal held his final show before he quit, saying, very ironically, that there was no one left to dress. And as a fellow ironist, I can see that attempt at sincerity in the way that Dimna incorporated a golden replica of Cristobal's own thimble into the show. I can see the irony of putting this plain looking chunky sweater in an haute couture runway show and the sincerity of it actually being micro chain mail. A process that surely took months to get right and hundreds of hours to execute. As Diet Prada and Oat Hadil pointed out, there's nearly endless comparisons between the clothes that were shown at this season's Oat Couture show and classics by Cristobal Balenciaga himself. By the way, if you don't follow Oat Hadil on Instagram, her account is outstanding. It's mostly in Arabic, but you don't even need to be able to read it to benefit from it. This stuff is some of the best fashion content on Instagram that I've ever seen. Let's keep moving, but I'm gonna link her down in the description. And for those who have looked at this and claimed that it's the death of haute couture, I would truly, genuinely ask you to explain because I don't understand what's meant by that. This collection is filled with vintage wools, satins, silks, and the Zeus of cloth, Vicuña. And sure, there's literal jokes in here. These bathrobe looking things are actually made of micro knifed leather. And I realize that's not like ha ha funny, but I mean, come on, that, that, is, that is pretty funny. <laughs> and even in the silence of the runway show, what are we to make of that? It's very John Cage, right? Super postmodern. The sound of the clothes is the soundtrack. Awkward, stilted, hollow sounding. Surely this is a joke, but Cristobal Balenciaga himself, along with every other couturier, had silent showings. They allowed people to get absorbed in the clothes that they were showing. Is Dimna being ironic here? Yes, I think that like all of us, irony is in Dimna's bones. Is this just a joke? I, I really don't think it is just a joke. I think this is sincerity through irony, and I think it's pretty good. Friends, if this analysis is useful to you, I would ask that you please support it on Patreon. The channel is my full-time job and I depend on the income from Patreon specifically in order to make this project possible. The link is down in the description. Go follow me on Instagram and Twitter. And again, I would love to hear what you have to say about this. I would really like to get some good conversations started down in the comments. I'm not trying to, but I love you and I can't help it. Sorry, goodbye.